<laughs> so metta, loving kindness, comes from the root word mitta, which actually means friend or friendliness, friendship. And I think this is a really nice kind of way to understand loving kindness because we can't always necessarily feel effusive love for ourselves or for all beings, but we can always find ways to become a little bit more intimate, a little bit more friendly and warm to ourselves, to treat us with a little bit more respect, maybe less control, less uh, managing and manipulating. And um, it's also known as loving friendliness or loving kindness because kindness is obviously a huge uh, part of the path. It's actually one of the right intentions that the Buddha talks about in the Eightfold Path. The right intentions are the intention of loving-kindness, uh, the intention of non-cruelty, which could be understood to be compassion or to be gentleness, and the right intention of letting go or making peace, renouncing, the opposite of sensual desire, and loving-kindness is a very exalted type of love because it is very different from sensual desire. And there are different words for those kind of love in the suttas, like the word priya means sort of affection, you know, the kind of love we might have for someone very dear, very close. And then there's the word karma, k-long-a-m-a, which means like um, sensuality, like passionate love, which is not really love at all, it's more of a, a craving, a desire to get something from the other person. So obviously these kinds of loves expect something in return. Yeah? There's some sort of reciprocity there, even if it's only something like sharing similar interests or being particularly compatible, you know, enjoying each other's company. There's nothing wrong with that. But the kind of love that the Buddha's teaching is a more protective, all-embracing, um, pervasive love, which extends to all beings, and not only to beings, but to our experience to our inner experience. So loving kindness is also a way of relating to our own um, emotions, to our moods, to our thoughts, yeah? And um, a way of relating to experience, whatever experience we come across in life. You know, we have two options. We can either um, fight and resist and, and try to change things, which, you know, is important when they can be changed but also learn to have acceptance where they can't, yeah? And at the same time, be able to influence our response to those difficult, aggravating situations. For example, the COVID crisis, yeah? Old age, sickness and death, we're being reminded of this all the time. People of young age are dying, of course. It's not only um, the elderly or the vulnerable, or even those with underlying health conditions who are affected. We're all affected, and we're all fragile. You know, we all could potentially meet a, a so-called early death at any time. And this is the great uh, messenger, in a sense, of a situation like a global pandemic. That obviously some people are more at risk than others, depending on their situation in life. You know, it's not right to say we're all in the same boat, because we're not. Some of us have a great big cruise liner, and some of us have a little dinghy on the ocean. You know, you're going to experience that storm very differently. But at the same time, if, you know, death or sickness is inevitable, we have a choice as to how we can approach that, how we can relate to that. You know, can we come to some kind of acceptance, make peace? and learn to relate wisely to that, so that our compassion can grow. So suffering isn't only necessarily a negative thing. If we can use that suffering to gain deeper understanding into the way things are, and actually allow that suffering to transform into compassion. Sometimes it's only when we really experience the difficulties in life that we have a chance to dig a bit deeper and learn to empathise with others. It's very easy to think that, oh, it won't come to me. It's, you know, being ill, whether it's chronic illness or losing a job or whatever it is, you know, losing a child. This is something that happens to others, but it, it won't happen to us, we hope. But when things like this happen, I think it gives us this perspective that we're all subject to things going wrong, you know, to loss, to grief, and to difficulties in life. And so this loving-kindness includes all of this, it includes our response to all of this, and it is an antidote to the kind of um, anger, resistance, uh, inner struggle that we have towards life and towards, you know, other beings as well, 
people who get on our nerves, people who we can't understand, we just think their behaviour, their actions are full of cruelty, and which may be the case, but there is a reason for that. And I think when we start to practice on the path, we realise that whenever we generate any kind of negativity or anger, we're the first one to be harmed. Somebody said this morning they feel it like a poison within themselves. You know, this anger is defiling the mind in a sense, obscuring the mind, making it sick in, in a sense. And we're not in our right mind, you could say, when we have anger. And, um, and metta is an antidote to that. Yeah? And the practice of metta also gives us a lot of insight into the obstacles in our hearts towards having loving kindness. So we're bound to come across so-called disagreeable states like anger, irritation, areas of contraction, you know, thoughts, feelings, situations, other people who we haven't yet fully allowed into our heart, or we haven't allowed our kindness to extend out toward, let's say. Yeah. So the Buddha said that loving kindness and aversion cannot coexist when you have thoughts of loving kindness. At that moment, it's impossible to have thoughts of anger at the same time, right? So with loving kindness, it's wonderful because even if we're not at the stage of experiencing a kind of opening of heart, we can be planting in these right thoughts, these right intentions that the Buddha talked about in the Eightfold Path and knowing that whilst doing that, you're at least preventing the unwholesome thoughts from entering in. So it's also very um, aligned with right effort. Right effort is the um, sixth factor of the Eightfold Path. And the Buddha said that if there's one thing on account of which one attends carefully, unrisen, unwholesome thoughts do not arise, and the arisen are abandoned and cannot find a footing, it is loving kindness. So loving kindness and the practice of loving kindness fulfills those first two right efforts, the restraining of the unwholesome and the abandoning of the unwholesome. But also, of course, it fulfills the other two as well, because we're cultivating and with practice maintaining the wholesome states of mind, yeah, states of loving kindness. And loving kindness is so um, related to states of gratitude, contentment, acceptance, general goodwill, yeah, peace, joy, all of these beautiful qualities that are a part and parcel of loving kindness and can also stimulate that loving kindness. Hopefully some of you experienced that during the lunchtime. I suggested that when you eat your food, you do so reflectively, reflecting on where it came from, how many people were involved, in, including yourself, into bringing that food onto your plate. You know, I wonder if anybody noticed the loving kindness involved in feeding yourself a nice meal. I'm getting quite good at that now because uh, I'm in a situation which is very unusual for a nun where I have to cook for myself because there's no other choice. And uh, the Buddha was so compassionate that he could foresee this kind of situation and he actually um, laid down a rule that said, monks and nuns, you can cook in times of danger and famine and difficulty. So I'm using that clause and I'm just noticing how the, um, the uh, practice of cooking allows me to bring in more loving kindness and care into my life. I can choose to make something quick and just put it all together, slapdash, however it turns out. Or I can think, actually, I've got this as well. I've got a bit of this in the fridge, and mm, a bit more of this, sort of salty or spicy, or a bit of sour would also go well. And I'm doing this really with an intention of kindness and care, and I find it very nurturing, actually. You know, that little bit more effort, that little bit more time, makes me feel um, cared for, you know? It's a way that I can care for myself. I don't even have anyone here to make a cup of tea for, but I'm often thinking that I wish I could share my lunch. <laughs> And some of my supporters have said, oh, maybe afterwards, you know, you better cook it for us. And I said, well, yeah, but if you're here, then that allowance doesn't count anymore. <laughs> so sorry about that. But I can't I cook for you. <laughs> Slightly a shame, actually. But uh, one other word I wanted to bring into uh, play here, which came to me while I was resting, actually, was the idea of loving kindness as... Um, an attitude of non-contention, hmm? non-contention with the world, which I think is also very beautiful. You know, this idea of not fighting the world so much, not being at, you know, at odds with reality. And again, I think this doesn't mean just letting everything go wrong, just letting kind of corrupt government stay in power and, 
you know, watching the whole climate uh, catastrophe unfold without doing anything about it. It doesn't mean that. But it does mean having the wisdom to know what you can change and what you can't. Yeah? And being able to put direct your energy and effort in the places that you can bring about some effect mm, whilst remaining balanced within yourself. And I think when action comes from a place of love and kindness, it's so much more powerful and sustainable because you have this kind of inner wellspring of well-being that you can resource yourself with. You can go back to drink from, so to speak, whenever you need to. Mm. So you're not just running on empty and sort of putting the whole world's, um, uh, what would you say, like trying to save the world in a sense, like all the um, crises and struggles and poverty of the whole world, you're not carrying that on your shoulders to the extent that it crushes you. You know, you're actually able to resource yourself so you really have something to give and you know when to pull back and just have a break. And also, at the time when you do have a break, reflect on the beautiful kindness that you've done. Reflect on your volition, your intention, and where that was coming from, and rejoice in that. Yeah. So often we kind of look at what's missing. We look at what we haven't been able to do, or where we snapped at somebody when we really shouldn't have, or was a bit too short with somebody. Instead of looking at all the wonderful things we did to encourage another person, or to encourage ourselves. Hmm? and really notice those qualities in our heart. So this morning we started the meditation by bringing to mind some of the um, qualities that we can appreciate in ourselves. And this doesn't mean getting a big head. <laughs> My teacher Ajahn Brahm always says it will just give you a big heart. <laughs> and that's really true, because you have to include yourself in your heart, right? <laughs> and often we've omitted that step and we're not in there. So <laughs> by actually stepping into your own heart, you, you get a bigger heart. And the purpose of this is not to sort of uh, stroke one's ego or, or shine it up. It's actually to start understanding causality, to start understanding that there are effects of our actions. Hmm? So if we act from a kind place and the action is helpful, is timely, is skillful, is genuinely coming from a place of wanting to help, wanting to protect wanting to encourage another person, then that will lead to good effects. Even if that doesn't help the person, we feel good. So we know we're on the right track. Yeah? The Buddha always says you can know it's the Dhamma if it leads to peace, if it leads to kind of settling the, the arguments. You know, I mean, it doesn't literally say that, but just on the theme of non-contention, peace is a kind of settling of things, yeah? of settling the contention, the arguing with the world, and um, coming in more into alignment with the way things actually are. You know, there is suffering, and if, we, if there weren't suffering, old age, sickness, and death, the Buddha said he wouldn't. He wouldn't arise in the world. There would be no need for a Buddha. There would be no need for a path. The Buddha teaches out of compassion to free us from old age, sick, sickness, and death. So this is really the big picture. But I'm talking about lots of things that are not, well, sort of related to metta. But I also want to get on to um, a little bit more about how it works. Hmm? So the Buddha talked about uh, certain benefits that we can have from loving kindness practice. And again, this, you know, um, might not arise immediately as benefits. And the practice of loving kindness is an ongoing cultivation. But this is the general direction that it's leading us to. And the first three or four are what you may say sound quite mundane, but they are basically that one falls to sleep easily. That's quite useful. And that when asleep, one has no bad dreams. You know, I think this is perhaps related to the fact that, you know, you don't have any remorse or unfinished business in the heart. You know, you can actually sleep quietly and allow yourself some rest. And also that one wakes up in a good mood, wakes up happy. Happy to meet the day. If you don't wake up happy, I suggest just doing a few phases of loving kindness. You know, just aligning yourself with the best of your intentions before you even get up and out of bed. Yeah, just to sort of remind yourself, wow, here I am, I have a human life. And there's a possibility to bring some kindness, to bring some compassion into the world today. Yeah, or, or just literally say the phrases to yourself. You know, choose... Some phrases of metta, the classic ones are things like, may I be happy, 
may I be peaceful, may I be free, may I be well, safe, content. You know, you can get creative, but things which are generally universal um, wishes that you could extend to anybody. So it's not like, may I get a good job, or may I stop my arguments with such and such person. That's not universal. It's something wider, broader, that can be applied, that you'd want for anybody. And yet, which is particularly resonant for you. And then he said that we become dear to humans and to devas. I think this includes animals as well. Some may or may not believe in such things as deities or devas. I personally uh, am pretty sure that they exist. I know quite a few people that perceive these beings in, in you know, basically in just subtler bodies. Um, but whether or not you believe that, there are sort of different energy frequencies, we can say, in the world. And we become dear to those people and also protected by them. And I think, you know, you can see this. When you're a person with some amount of moral integrity, people tend to trust you. They feel safe around you, you know. If I think about the people that I feel safest around or um, most at ease with, they tend to be people who've cultivated a very, very strong virtue, very strong loving kindness in their heart. And to be around them just makes you, puts you at ease instantly because you know they're not looking at you with critical eyes. You know, they're seeing your potential, they're seeing your um, capacity for awakening. Yeah. And ironically, it's often those people who are most highly, how can we say, awakened, I wouldn't want to say attained, who are the most humble. They're not the ones who feel that they're so different from you. They're actually the ones who know that because I managed to free my heart, this is speaking for them, um, so can you. Mm-hmm. And it's quite extraordinary to be around people that, like this. Um, it's as though you suddenly start seeing all these hidden potentials within yourself that were you were blind to before. And, uh, and also, yeah, Another one is that um, one's complexion becomes radiant, so you don't have to go out and get sunburned to have a radiant complexion. I'm just kidding. But uh, I think this is, you know, whether or not you look beautiful or radiant, you can definitely understand how somebody who generates a lot of anger and is constantly kind of at odds with other people starts to look quite aggressive. You know, you get lines on your face, the whole face starts to look tight and contorted. And of course it ages you very much. And then, uh, I, can't, I don't know if I've remembered all 11, but the one I wanted to point out at the end of this list is um, that one who develops loving kindness easily enters the still states of mind. And in, um, in Buddhism, these are called states of samadhi. Yeah? Samadhi just means um, deep meditation, deep stillness, deep uh, unity, oneness of mind. Usually it's translated as concentration, but I'm just staring right away from that word because that's not my experience of, um, of those uh, so-called states. I mean, it's also, uh, um, it's not that you're either in samadhi or you're not, it's a continuum, you know. It's a, and the reason stillness is nice is because the word stillness also indicates the way. It also indicates the path. We don't get there by concentrating, by narrowing down, by focus. We get there by gradually settling, stilling, and becoming at ease in our mind, allowing the mind to to rest Mm -hmm. and to um, merge with its object, so to speak. And the reason, of course, that we um, more easily can enter into samadhi and develop this um, deep sense of ease and rest in the mind is because we're overcoming the five hindrances through the practice of loving-kindness. We're overcoming, first of all, the ill will, But the ill will tends to feed the others, right? Whatever you're averse to is usually the opposite of what you desire. So, you know, the two are sort of two sides of the same coin. And then states like restlessness and worry, doubt, um, even sleepiness, drowsiness can be based on aversion, can be based on this kind of um, not really liking, not really wanting to be right where you are. Yeah. Sometimes sleepiness is an attempt to just escape the moment. It's not interesting enough for us, it's not engaging, we don't really want to be here. Yeah. Or even sometimes we're traumatised by something, something terrible's happened and the way you cope with that is just to zone out, to go to sleep. Apparently in prisons it's very common. 
my teacher, Adrian Brown, said he used to go to the prisons and he'd meet um, prisoners there and they used to say, one extra hour of your sleep is an hour off your sentence. So they'd actually sleep as much as they can to avoid this miserable experience of being in prison. (laughs) And sometimes it's the same with our own mind. We're not finding the joy in the practice. We're not finding contentment and appreciation for the moment. So we get drowsy or restless, the mind jumps past to future, future to past, fantasy world. (laughs) And this loving kindness just helps us to see what's already right there and appreciate that this is good enough. Mm -hmm. So there's also a lot of uh, scope for wisdom through the metta practice. It's not only getting into the deep states of meditation, which is a very important part of the path, but also the kind of wisdom that can arise through the practice of metta. And of course the first one is that Through samadhi itself, we have more of a chance to see things as they truly are. Samadhi pachya yata bhuta jnana dasana, the Buddha said. Samadhi is the proximate cause for seeing things as they truly are. Again, because these five hindrances are temporarily overcome. Um, He also compares the mind at that time to like molten gold. He said it's like you've purified gold from its um, impurities like tin, lead, copper, whatever else. And you melt this gold down so that it's free from all these impurities. And at that point, the gold is fit for work. In the same way, the mind becomes soft. It becomes malleable. It becomes fit for work, fit for the work of insight. We're less um, invested in what we see. Yeah? We may think we understand and we're ready to see the truth of impermanent suffering and non-self. But most of the time, we, we're repelled from those truths. We don't want to believe it, you know. Okay, things are suffering, but that's only because I'm attached. Or, okay, some things are suffering, but life is still beautiful. Yes, well, there are beautiful things in life, but ultimately, if what we're attached to is impermanent, and even, you know, (laughs) I mean, you can't just say it's attachment. Basically, everything is impermanent, and it's that impermanent nature that means it cannot be inherently satisfying, lasting, productive of deep, lasting peace. Mm -hmm. The Buddha actually said, why, if I myself am subject to birth, ageing and death, why do I seek the same things that are also subject to birth, ageing and death? What if I seek something different? What if I seek the escape? But this is very difficult to understand, and especially if we move into those kind of um, um, insight practices too soon, before the mind has this sort of deep... um, Um, well, softness and resilience and also a sense of Mm well-being so that we feel resourced, we have a sort of way to access a different kind of happiness within ourselves. then we're more able to let go of the so-called coarser happinesses that we may depend upon um, until that point. So it kind of helps us to wean off the lesser pleasures and to start um, appreciating the more refined pleasures of the mind. And this is one of the particular attributes of metta, because it is by nature very pleasant, very um, fulfilling, satisfying, and calming. Mm -hmm. So it's not an agitated, kind of restless, um, excited happiness. It's something much more sustaining and peaceful and deeply nourishing, yeah. So another thing that I find very interesting about the metta practice is that it really starts to show you how our mind conditions the way we see the world, basically, right? So when we have, I don't know, a groggy mood, we wake up on the wrong side of bed, so to speak, sometimes if we allow our mind to start thinking of our past, of our life history at that point, it all looks so grey. You know, we can't see anything that went right, everything looks like it went wrong, and, you know, all the incidents that were the most difficult, you sort of string them all together and come up with this big story about how terrible everything's been so far, just because you don't feel good at that moment, and therefore how bad it's going to be the next day, the next year, (laughs) in 20 years' time. Whereas when we have a mind of love and kindness, which is very um, contented, we look upon our life, our past, Um, ourself, our qualities, in a completely different way. We tend to pick out all the beautiful things, all the things that did work, you know, the the general direction of our life, which I think for all of us we can really safely say is going in the right direction. Um, 
So the past and future look very different. They're conditioned by the current state of mind. And of course, also, your reactions to things change enormously. So that the things that used to irritate you maybe don't. For example, I was in um, Perth a couple of years ago on my men's retreat, and a few days into my solitary retreat, I noticed that the roof kept on banging really loudly whenever the sun came out because it would start expanding. And it was like, boom! <laughs> Just as I was trying to, you know, settle. Boom! And I remember thinking at that point, gosh, I've got like three months of this. And then that night, for some reason, something came up from the past that just needed a little bit of attention, a little bit of healing. And I was doing some walking meditation and um, a person in my life who'd hurt me very much came to mind. And, uh, and I realised that I was still hurting. And I was able to just imagine myself giving myself a kind of um, massage. It was kind of strange. It was like... I think I imagine that my teacher was massaging my feet and I was holding my head or something like this. It was just one of those spontaneous things. I mean, you could never, like, actually create that as a type of meditation. It was just, that was the image that came to mind. And so I was really getting the kind of healing and the care that I needed. And uh, a few tears came out and I felt like something shift. And then the next day, I slept quite well. Then the next day I was sitting to meditate and I noticed the bang... And uh, But I noticed it didn't really impact me at all. You know, I wasn't reacting to it. And I carried on meditating. I'm not sure if it was meta-meditation. I usually infuse a lot of kindness into whatever I'm aware of. And uh, I was there for hours. And after at the end of it, I realised I hadn't heard a thing. I hadn't heard the banging. <laughs> so this is really interesting. Because it's not only that we start to change our relationship and... and start to react differently to things, we actually start to notice different things depending on our state of mind. <laughs> yeah. So imagine the implications that might have for, say, meeting somebody who you feel irritated with. You actually stop noticing those difficult things that trigger you. First of all, of course, your reactions are softer. But after a while, you start to see them in a completely different light. You start to see yourself in a completely different light. And the whole world starts to change. Obviously, in states of deep um, meditation and states of strong mindfulness also, you start to see the beauty in the world. You know, just the light shining on the trees, on the leaves, fluttering in the wind. We've got a stunning park close to me, which I call the Thousand Tree Park. And I, I go there once or twice a day just to be with the trees. I've started imagining now that they miss me when I don't say hello, but... Really, it's just because I like to see them. And uh, the light shining on those leaves is so fantastic and it changes throughout the day. And I notice, you know, when, especially if I have a meditation day and go to that park, everything is brighter, more delightful, more beautiful, richer in colour and uh, more calming to the mind. So these are just some of the advantages of the meta meditation and I wanted to get into some guided meditation again. And uh, what I've been doing, I'm doing usually a, a weekly meta group on a Saturday morning. And what I've been doing is going through various categories to send a meta to all various people, starting usually with oneself or with someone who's dear to oneself. So in other words, people we don't tend to have a lot of difficulty with. I mean, some of us might not think we like ourselves or accept ourselves completely, but um, generally... We have a sense of self-care. We want to be safe. We want to be happy. We want to be well-fed. Yeah, we do generally try to do what's good for us. And we usually spend quite a lot of time thinking about ourselves. So there is some self-care there. <laughs> so we start in this way. Now, in the suttas, the Buddha talks only really about spreading metta in the four directions. So it's a very expansive, pervasive um, widening of mind so your mind becomes big vast and you spread it in all directions and I think this is something we can do further down the path I think for many people it's difficult to just connect to the feelings of metta immediately and just start spreading it um, so what they talk about in the commentaries in particular in the Visuddhi Magga is to start with the different categories of being and to go through them stage by stage systematically so the reason that we start with an easy person is because it's like you want to light a fire. And if you want to light a fire, first of all, you have to put on some kind of 
maybe dry grass or very fine kindling on that fire to get it going. Yeah. So these are the things which quickly take light. They're easy to start the fire with. So in the same way, we choose people who are easy to get that fire of loving kindness um, going in the heart, so to speak, in the hearth of your heart. <laughs> I remember once telling a teacher in, uh, in uh, it was in Santi Monastery in New South Wales in Australia, and he's a wonderful Burmese monk, actually he's um, French-Canadian, but he's trained in Burma for many, many years, since 1979, I think, he's been um, a monk and a very, very wise, beautiful being. And it was quite cold there, it was the winter time, and we had to make little fire, uh, a fire in our huts. But the fire, um, what do you call it, a can, a can, a canister, stove, maybe a fire stove, they were like cylindrical, like this. And they, very narrow, very small, and they didn't really have any air holes, so it was quite hard to get the fire going. So he asked me how to do it, and I said, well, you start with the kindling, and then, you know, you put on a few smaller logs, and when that's going, you put on a few bigger logs, and, and like this, and maybe start with some candles or something, so the wax burns for a bit longer. <laughs> then he came into the meditation that afternoon, and he said, well, I start, he's got a really adorable Finnish accent, very strong. And he's, I'm not going to try it. <laughs> uh, and he said, well, I did what you said and I just got smoke in the room, just complete smoke. I was smoked out. And I said, really? He said, yes, I put in the kindling and the other logs and then the big heavy logs. I said, I said what, like all at once? He said, yes, you told me to put it. I said, no, no, one by one. <laughs> and he thought I'd said all at once. So he put the whole lot on straight away and the thing went up in smoke. So, so this is what might happen if you go through the categories too quickly or you try to use the difficult person, which can be likened to the big, wet, sappy log. If you try to put them on the fire first or at the same time as the kindling, it'll all go to smoke. It won't work. So we start with these um, easy people in our lives. And we're going to start with ourselves as well because, after all, ourself is where this meta is emanating from. Hmm? And so the way we do it is to start discursively. So we start by using language. We start by, um, let's say, um, planting phrases. Yeah. So we're not kind of speaking to ourselves in a kind of like ordering ourselves to feel love and kindness. We're just planting these lovely wishes and intentions very tenderly, very gently, and repetitively in the heart. Hmm? So we plant these seeds, these um, phrases, and then we listen to where those phrases are pointing to. So that it's not the words which we understand as meta itself, but it's where those words are pointing to. So it's like you say the phrase to yourself, may I be happy. And then you just connect with your body, you connect with your inner world, and you listen. And then very mindfully, very carefully, you plant the next phrase, may I be peaceful, whatever it is, and you listen. And so those phrases and that listening in between becomes your primary meditation object. Yeah? Sometimes we may have been using sensations or the breath, but now we're using these phrases of metta and that listening to where it's pointing as our primary uh, meditation object. And like in any meditation, the mind may wander away and then you have to sort of remember, whoops, I was supposed to be using metta. But it's a really useful practice for people whose minds are quite talkative because it's direct substitution of one type of thought for a more wholesome, simpler kind of thought. So if your mind's very talkative, it can be helpful to use these phrases in fairly quick succession, you know, just to keep saying them for some time. And you'll probably notice that if your mind starts to become calmer, you need to plant them in less and less. You can have longer gaps or you may even drop down to a single word. So it may start as, may I be happy, may I be free, may I be healed, may I be at peace. They're my usual four. And then it may end up with quite a big gap between each, and in the end it may just be happy, free, healed. Yeah? And so you say these to yourself in a very soothing but very clear way. And you just listen to where they're pointing. And just give it time. You're not looking for results. You're not looking for some kind of um, 
uh, reward for the practice. You're just trusting in the power of the intention of loving kindness, trusting in that power for the loving kindness to start to blossom and grow. And it does in time because we're inclining our mind in a certain direction. And the Buddha said, whatever you frequently reflect upon and ponder becomes the inclination of the mind. Yeah. So the more we can do this, the more we can substitute our usual ways of looking, usual ways of thinking, and try to align them more and more to loving kindness, the more we give these qualities a chance to really um, take light in the heart and to create a very warm, lasting fire, a gentle fire of metta that can be generated to all beings. Okay? So, it is uh, almost 20 to 2, so I think we'll have... Um, about half an hour of meditation now. Um, so if you'd like to just have a quick stretch or go to the toilet if you want to, we'll try to move fairly quickly into the next session, but do take a few minutes if you need to. One of the things I'm starting to do from time to time is, because there's no contact, I mean, not that I ever have that much contact, is just give myself a little rub, you know, like a little massage on any area that might feel tight. You could massage your neck a bit or your shoulders. Or just have a little stretch. <laughs> stretch the back, stretch the arms. And just see how your body feels. You may have started in one posture, intending to continue in that posture, but you may want to change your mind and try a different one. If you were sitting on the floor, you might want to sit on a chair or a sofa. If you're on a sofa, you might want to lean up against that sofa instead or try sitting cross-legged. I'm not saying you have to change, but just see if you can connect to your body and allow your body to to decide rather than your mind to dictate. there will be time after this for some movement and getting a drink and all those things so just a half an hour or so so when you're ready and you don't have to be ready right now. We can't hear you if you're still moving around, it's okay. Uh, but when you are ready, just coming back into sitting, or if you want to, you could try standing for some time. Usually not recommended for long periods and not with your eyes fully closed. And just Allowing your attention to settle into the body. And infusing your mindfulness, your awareness, with a sense of warmth and kindness. So that wherever mindfulness shines, you can also use it as a medium to channel kindness to that particular area of the body. The best simile I've heard is from my teacher Ajahn Brahm. He says, it's like uh, he coined the word kindfulness. So that's kind, mindfulness along with kindness. And he said that mindfulness is like the light of the sun. And kindness is like the warmth. So it's not just a simple knowing, it's also an attitude of friendliness. 
an attitude of respect. Treating your body as a friend with gratitude, with genuine care. And allowing the body to give you feedback. Is there anything you can do to make the body more comfortable and at ease? Just spreading that kindfulness to every part of the body, part by part. You can start from the top of the head or if you want from the tips of the toes. And just allow it to spread part by part to every area of the body. If you wish, you can stay on the surface level of the body, the skin, or allow it to spread deep inside. Giving special attention to any areas of tightness, maybe parts of the body which are not well, which need a little more care and attention. Sometimes emotions are stuck, so to speak, in the body. Maybe feelings of anxiety in the tummy or the chest. See if you can shine that beautiful light and warmth of kindfulness. Allowing it to suffuse every experience. Without trying to change or get rid of anything. Your only job is to care. Notice how it feels, how the body relaxes in the presence of loving kindness. And allowing yourself to enjoy the feeling of a relaxed body. Without focusing on the bits that are maybe uncomfortable or less at ease. Noticing any pleasant sensation. The slightest amount of Warmth or tingling, softening, relaxation. And allowing that to calm the mind.
So remaining connected to your felt sense of the body. I'd like to encourage you to just bring to mind a quality within your own heart that you really appreciate and respect. Or it could be something you've done for another person or even for yourself. That you feel good about, that you sense was moving in the right direction, was aligned with the Dhamma and perhaps brought about a lessening of suffering. Bring it to mind and allow the mind to rejoice in that goodness. Noticing this as a direct consequence of pure intentions, goodness in the heart. It leads to that happiness, that joy, self-respect. going to continue to extend loving kindness, thoughts of loving kindness towards ourself. So choosing three or four phrases. Sometimes people like to choose only one. But really capture what you wish for yourself. And repeating these to yourself clearly, calmly, rhythmically. Trusting in the power of those thoughts and intentions to kindle the fire, the warmth of loving kindness in the heart in its own time. Remaining connected to the felt sense of the body, perhaps in particular to any pleasant feeling, maybe in the heart area or the palms of the hands. And listening deeply to where those intentions, those thoughts are pointing.
And if at any time during these meditations, anything, any emotion which is difficult or needs attention arises, you can either continue with the phrases of loving kindness or fall back to the simple kindfulness the unconditional loving awareness and just tend to whatever needs attention. Always being very gentle with the mind. If you want to continue to practice this loving kindness towards yourself, feel free to do so. For those who wish, we're going to bring in the dear person. Staying connected to your embodied experience. Connected to your heart. Bringing to mind a person who's very dear to you. Someone with whom you have quite a pure, simple, nourishing relationship with. Who brings a smile to your face simply to recollect them. Could be a best friend. Maybe a teacher or a spiritual companion. Could be a partner, a child or a parent. Although the last two may be a little bit more complicated. So choose someone who you have quite a straightforward relationship with. Take your time to make that choice. And if you're a visual person, you may even be able to conjure an image or a sense of that person in your mind, as though they were sitting or standing before you. You were smiling into their eyes. It doesn't have to be super clear, just a sense of that person. Or perhaps just a felt sense, imagining, remembering how it feels to be around them. Maybe bringing to mind one or two of the qualities you most appreciate. Their kindness, trustworthiness. 
whatever it is, so that you have a clear sense of a recipient of your loving kindness, greeting them, welcoming them into the field of loving kindness. And allowing this loving kindness to spread from your body, from your mind, and suffuse this dear person with loving kindness, as though every phrase were a precious gift you are offering to them. say, may you be happy, or insert the person's name, whatever feels good for you, and try to make those wishes of loving kindness very relevant for that person. Repeating the phrases and listening to that space in between to where, towards where these words are pointing. And also imagining that person receiving the loving kindness, becoming at ease, relaxed knowing that they're cared for deeply.
staying relaxed. If you notice you're making a little too much effort and becoming tense, just step back a little bit. And reconnect with your beautiful good wishes for this dear person. The feeling in your own heart. And this person's presence and ease. Using the phrases only as much as it's helpful. And trusting more and more in that silence. Where the energy of metta grows. Great gratitude and kindness. We're going to bid farewell to this person. Say goodbye, perhaps with a gesture or even a hug. And just gradually let them fade away from your awareness, remaining connected to your body sitting. Noticing how you feel. And again, very gently spreading loving awareness to every part of your body and mind. may be possible to feel the whole body at once. Notice any sense of well-being or ease. And once again with great kindness and tenderness, just extending the wishes of loving kindness towards yourself. Recognizing your own wish to be happy and free from suffering. Thanking yourself for your practice. For offering yourself the gift of peace. Having my little bell and the can listen to the sound and at the end of the third sound you can gently open your eyes.
that was nice, thank you. <laughs> it's really lovely to practice as a group for so much of the day. So now I wanted to give us all an opportunity for some walking meditation. Some of you may have already been practicing walking with loving kindness earlier on today. Um, so now's another chance. And uh, the invitation is to find a space of about between 7 and 15 steps. However much space you have available. If you wish to get outside, you can. I don't know if people have got gardens or patios, terraces like me, or even a, a park very close by. that would have to be quite close because we've only got half an hour. Um, but the invitation is just to bring this attitude and intention of loving kindness into the walking so that not only are we mindful of each step and all the sensations in the foot as it touches the ground, as it rises up from the ground, as you move it through the air and place it down. But also infuse that awareness again with kindness. And if you wish, I mean that's one method, you could focus on, on that if you want to um, do a more kind of general practice. The other possibility is to um, do the walking, of course being aware of your body moving, especially the moving parts of the body, and continue to generate loving-kindness using the phrases. I would suggest probably dropping down to a single phrase, or maybe two phrases if you wish, um, to keep it simple because there's a lot already going on with the body moving. And uh, just to be aware of keeping the body relaxed, because sometimes when we're walking, and obviously the walking gets a little bit slower than ordinary walking, um, sometimes there's a tendency in meditators to start becoming a bit stiff and a bit tight as that we may be trying too hard to be aware of every little sensation. So just notice that tendency and keep on releasing, relaxing, softening and bringing up that loving kindness in the heart. Um, well, that's something else I was going to say which has almost escaped me. Yeah. Just whatever, whatever feels good for you, whatever feels easeful and, and helps to continue with this loving kindness, with this attitude. And uh, if you want to get a cup of tea, that's also fine. Um, if you want to do standing meditation, that's another possibility, or even just have a little lie down if you're feeling sleepy. Whatever you feel like doing at this time. Nobody's watching, <laughs> but it can be really nice to start bringing um, all these practices, including loving kindness, into the walking posture because it's something we're doing so often during the day. You know, whether it's just between one room and another, or up the stairs to the loo and back down, or taking the food through into another room, you know, we're often um, busy with these activities and, and don't really perceive them as opportunities to practice. So having some familiarity with loving kindness in the walking posture will help with that continuity in daily life. And I'm sure there was something important to say, but hopefully <laughs> we'll be able to connect on more about Meta afterwards when you come back. So I think we'll have about half an hour. Um, I'm not going to ask for questions about anything sort of um, anything very deep at the moment, but I would like to just check whether the instructions are clear or you'd like any more clarification before we move into the walking period. So if that's the case, uh, please raise your hand and we will take a question or two just to make sure you know what to do next. And if you do choose a cup of tea and sit down in the garden, also just notice your intentions and uh, offer that cup of tea to yourself with great care and kindness, drinking it with gratitude, appreciating the opportunity to quench your thirst and revive your energy. Good, so nothing seems unclear, so this is a good sign. Um, I think if you can leave your computer on, it's probably the best because 
it will take time otherwise for everybody to re-sign in and you'll come back in the waiting room, we'll have to bring you in again. So I'm just going to keep my computer going, plugged in, so that I don't run out of battery halfway through. And uh, you're all on mute, so we can't hear, you know, if you're talking to your kids or your members of the family, that's fine. If you're not and you don't need to, then try and keep this as a space for yourself to continue the practice and to deepen into that sense of well-being and ease. Okay? And we'll meet again at about quarter to four. Okay? Great.